While you're standing, let me read some more from this wonderful book. How I enjoyed that word from God that we have heard today. Tremendous. We need to understand what the Spirit has to say for our day. And I believe we heard today some very, very vital things. Reading from John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. God bless you. You may be seated. When God gave me the experience that I, won't, I must share with you today, I don't ever really want to talk about this, but whenever he speaks to me, he told me, whenever I let you know, you are to share this experience. When he told me to write it in 1988, I said, Lord, I don't even make notes. How can I, um, what I, I don't even preach from notes. I don't even, I don't even study with notes. Uh, I, I write things down, but I never see them. I mean, don't find them again, uh, so it doesn't do much good. Uh, but uh, how can I write a sermon? And he said, you write, and I'll anoint you just like I do when you preach. And I thought, well, that'll be the last time I'll ever speak that. I've written it down now, and that's it. But that's not the way it has been. And it's not often, but uh, when he speaks, I listen. The scripture I've just read to you, we used so often in Africa. It was a starting place. This was where we started with uh, new people that knew nothing about Jesus Christ. We started here. We'd been in Africa four years, and uh, things were not going as well as we would like. I will never forget, we had a tent meeting, and 51 got the Holy Ghost, and oh my, we were just rejoicing about this. And then one of them killed a man, one of those that got the Holy Ghost. And they don't fool around over there. I mean, the next thing we knew, he was hung. Thank God he prayed through again <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> so maybe we can still count him as a soul that was one. But we felt like that there was something lacking in us, something lacking in what we were doing. And we, we felt like we had such a tremendous job with the segregation that South Africa had. We had every town we went to, we had to start four churches a church for the black people, the tribal blacks, a church for the mixed-blooded people because nobody would have them, uh, and uh, then a church for the Asiatic Indians, of which we had many, and a church also then for the white people there. It all had to be separated. And that was very, very difficult and uh, was just four times as much work as it should have been. We spread ourselves very thin trying to just uh, work from here to there because Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. And so we were doing our best to reach every creature, but our work was not as effective as we thought it ought to be. So my husband said to me one day, he said, we're going to first of all repent of everything that might hinder us. He said, I want you to look into your life, and I'm going to look into my life. If there's anything back in the past that could be hindering us now, let's get it straightened out. And uh, thank God for the, re the preaching on repentance that we've heard here because it is so necessary. And, and, but when I was repenting, God showed me a, a great mistake that I had made. My father walked off and left my mother with five small sons to raise. They were 10, 8, 6, 4, and 2 years old. And then the last time I had seen him before I went to Africa, I said to him, I once had a dad and I loved him very much. I almost adored him and I don't know what happened to him and I don't know who you are. You are a stranger. And I turned on my heel and walked away. And God let me know that though my father had disappointed me and I felt badly about what had happened, I was wrong because he was still my father. And I, you must honor your earthly father, not because he's a good dad. I hope you had a good dad, but if you didn't. Uh, and God said, if you will do the right thing, I will still save your dad. Uh, and that promise God gave me in the early days in Africa, I held on to for years, and, and, he, and he did. The week before he died, 84 years old, God saved him. Hallelujah. God will keep his word. He may not do it yesterday, and it may not be next week, but he will keep his word. Well, I sat down immediately and wrote a letter to my dad. 
and restored the broken communications that was there. Uh, and, uh, well, I got that done. Then my husband said, all right, now we're going to fast and ask God. Let's ask him for the secret of revival. I appreciate a husband who has been a leader. And uh, he's a very sweet person. He loves kids. We started out many years ago. He said, honey, let's always be real nice to old people. He said, you know, there's something so wonderful in all their experiences and their memories. And we've done this all the years. And the other day I said, do you realize now we are old people? <laughs> but a lot of wonderful things has come back to us from this that we have done all of these years. But in his leadership, he had said, one day he got up out of bed and we had struggled uh, we couldn't seem to find a place to live that we could have room uh, to have uh, services and we couldn't find a place to we got everything going after a fashion but we couldn't get a start among the white people in South Africa because we could not rent a hall we could but without, without people they wouldn't rent you anything and we couldn't get anything we just couldn't get going I, and one morning he got up and he said honey I'm gonna build us a house I said did you fall on your head uh, you must have bumped your head real hard yesterday. I mean, there's no other way. We, we, there's days that we don't even see meat. Uh, weeks sometimes that we don't, don't have money for meat. We don't have the gas money to go to all the places. They're calling us to come. And how do you think you'll build a house? He said, I don't know. I have no idea. But God said, do it, so I'm going to do it. And then there was just a series of strange things happened and strangers and people that we didn't even know that came and helped us. And so by the time I tell you, we were in the process of building that house. He got the outbuildings done first and we moved in. It was very, very, very small and uncomfortable. And it was made worse by an invasion of spiders. They were, they looked about the size of your hand, you know, not quite so thick as my fingers, or skinny legs and all of that. But, and they were red and black and they were not poisonous, but they sure were disconcerting if they fell on your face at night, you know, or on your arm. And uh, I spent so many nights hunting spiders and killing spiders that I was just at the point of exhaustion. Somebody sent me a little offering said buy something that you really want so I went and bought a flashlight for each kid so they could do their own spider chasing <laughs> I said they absolutely wear, wearing me out and so uh, this particular night when it happened my husband had gone away to preach and got a call from some new people and he was gone and we were in this tiny little old place uh, the beginning of a home was out there but there hadn't been much awful much done on it at that point and as I lay there uh, in the bed I had been asleep and a light woke me up. This is not something I saw with uh, closed eyes. And I thought, oh, another spider hunter. This is maybe a big one or, or a bigger one or something. And I opened my eyes, but the light kept getting brighter. And I thought, this is strange. Opened my eyes expecting to see a child with a flashlight and aimed at my eyes. Uh, but what I saw was a being dressed in light who stood by my bed. And he said, your prayers have been heard. He said, I am bringing you the secret of revival. Hallelujah. I began to tremble. I was so afraid. And yet, I, I, I was so... I can't tell you how I felt. Uh, there was just such a mixture of joy and yet fear in my heart. And I couldn't say a word. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. This heavenly messenger could understand my thoughts. And he said, don't be afraid. <laughs> it is because God loves you and because you are in his will that he's going to show you the secret of revival. And... Uh, he unrolled a scroll in front of me, and it just was hanging there in the air, this beautiful scroll, and on it was written the words of Jesus that I have read. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And I looked at that scripture, and uh, amazing. We're at our best, we're carnal because my thought was I have used that scripture so much in fact in one tent meeting just before the one we were in right at that time we were in a tent meeting uh, I, I had started with any man one night 
And the next night I preached on thirst and I took it word for word and went through this. And I didn't think there was anything in that scripture that I had not found. And he rebuked me and said, you will never dig to the bottom of God's almighty word forever settled in the heavens is that word and you will never grasp with your human mind everything that he is trying to give you don't ever say this old familiar scripture it, it sounds like you're making it familiar in a almost a disrespectful term I don't like that phrase at all it never gets old it's always new it's always vital it's always real it's always wonderful hallelujah hallelujah and he said, look at the scroll. He rebuked me for my thoughts. <laughs> and he said, look at the scroll. And so I looked. And as I watched, I saw one word begin to enlarge. And that one word looked like it was set with illuminated diamonds. And he said, this is God's desire. And that word is found in that last phrase, out of your belly shall flow, flow, rivers of living water and then he began to talk to me as I looked at that I just fastened my eyes on it and I couldn't look away and he said last night in the tent meeting you sang about showers of blessings mercy drops round us are falling in your message you talked about uh, you referred to the scripture in Isaiah with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation he said I, God wants you to understand it's more than mercy drops it, it's more than showers it, it is more than buckets full he said rivers don't you understand that he is talking about rivers and you're trying to get by on drops and buckets full cups full are not going to get it done rivers is the promise and it's not just one big whoosh, one big river that, that comes. It is rivers that come and are supposed in God's plan to flow through those that know him. Just like you said, brother. He said, many people have received the Spirit. And they think it is a one-time glory hallelujah experience. And they live in the memory of it. And they have defeated God's plan. Because he said, what you are actually doing, you are trying to do my work with your strength. And your strength is profitless. You are trying to do my work with your understanding. And your sta understanding is hopelessly inadequate. You are trying to do my work with what you can figure out and move over and plan and what you can arrange. And I want the work to be done, God said through my spirit flowing through his children. He said, I'm going to show you how it should work. And then in front of me, I saw a preacher. And his hand was lifted up, and he had the Bible like this, and he's reading this very scripture. And I could hear amens, and oh, thank God, I could hear people. But he said, look closely at that scene. There is a deadness there that should not be. And I saw the hand of God move the preacher, church, and all out of the way. And then I saw another preacher. And standing in the same position with his hand lifted up and the Bible in his left hand, reading the same verse. But he said, now the Spirit of God is not visible, but I'm going to make it visible visible to you so you can understand what God wants to do and all of a sudden as I saw this man he was his hand was not only up like this he would do this and I saw from his fingertips there was flowing looked like rainbow colored light that's the only way I can describe it and every word that he spoke reading the precious word of God it gushed out of his mouth it swirled about him on the platform then he said look at the congregation and people that were just sitting there dead still not doing anything I could see this wonderful rivers of God's spirit flowing down in them and out through them and filling that whole church <laughs> And I thought about the dedication of the temple when the glory of God filled the house of God. And I have been in conferences three times when the Spirit of God filled the place like a smoke. A conferences are special. One, two was conferences. One was just a special meeting where the Spirit of God came like a smoke and filled the whole place. I think sometimes God makes it visible to try to help us to understand what He's doing and what He's trying to do. Uh, and he said, now keep looking. And as I watched, I saw a man come in the door, a haughty, 
aristocratic looking man and his very attitude says well I'm coming to your church but you won't get me on my knees and we have those who come like that but he sat down by an older couple that were just sitting there quietly once in a while a little hallelujah praise the Lord but the Spirit of God was pouring down into them and it circled this man as he sat there and he got very uncomfortable he sort of weak and twisting around in the seat and pretty soon he reaches <coughs> he does this and reaches in his pocket to get a handkerchief and he tries to wipe away the tears that came that he couldn't stop and he said he, no, no nothing a man could say would touch that man but the Spirit of God will do the work if it's flowing through God's children. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I kept watching and I saw that man stand and he took a step but he, then he just stopped and he said, my God, I'm lost. He just got to the aisle and he fell full length. The two sweet people knelt by him and then I heard him speaking in other tongues as God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> We're doing too much of it the hard way. We're doing too much of it in our own strength. We're doing too much of it with our own intelligence. And that is not going to do what Jesus wants done. It's got to be, it's got to be His Spirit flowing through us. Hallelujah. And then He said, I want to show you something else. And I'm looking at all of this and then all of a sudden I'm outside the church and I could see flowing out from the church in every direction. And I saw the Spirit of God as it moved. Uh, I saw a man and his wife arguing in their home and they're just about ready to, uh, to tackle each other physically with blows. Uh, and I saw they didn't even know that something had entered their room but there was enough Spirit of God flowing and filling that whole neighborhood. Let me tell you, uh, things uh, are bad in some places in our countries but where there's enough people that God's spirit is flowing through God is doing things we haven't the faintest idea of <laughs> and that softening influence of the Holy Ghost made that man say I'm sorry <laughs> and, and peace was restored then I saw a woman walking along uh, she looked like a rather down on your luck type of person she had on a dirty apron had a loaf of bread in one hand a cigarette between her fingers and, and she's just shuffling along down the street probably been to a little store but inside the church now they're singing and the beautiful song is coming out born on rivers of the Spirit of God and it circled her and she stopped and as she stood there she dropped the bread she dropped the cigarette uh, and inside the church I thought well now what's going to happen now but inside the church a lady from this side a lady from that side got up and eased out and they met at the door smiled at each other but there was not, not even any conversation and then they looked and they saw this lady and went to her as she, she took the dirty apron and covered her face and said oh I'm such a sinner I am so far from God uh, and they came to her put their arms around her and gave her a little bit of instruction quoted a few scriptures and I saw her lifting her hands and speaking in other tongues on the sidewalk as the Spirit of God poured. Oh, I want to tell you the truth this morning. We ain't seen nothing yet to what God would do if His people would allow His Spirit to flow through them. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> he said to me that you are struggling so hard to do something. He said, that altar call that you extended so long last night, if there had been more of the flow of the Spirit of God, when you stopped speaking, they would have come running to seek me. It's not what you can do, he said. It's what God will do through his Spirit. God is love. This love problem that we have and your own target when you're talking about love. The love problem that we have is because, you see, if we had more of Him flowing through us, 
there would be no problem with love whatsoever because the love would just be there and it would be flowing, a tangible thing almost that people could feel, almost touch uh, because the Spirit of God is so powerful and He hasn't limited us. In fact, the original promise here is rivers. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I never see a river that I don't think about. Uh, now, God wants a half a dozen of those to be flowing through us just like that. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And he said, you can do what you will. <laughs> but when you see the rivers of my spirit flowing, then you will see mighty revivals such as we have never seen. Now, God has been able to do some wonderful things in other countries. But, you know, we poor Americans, we've got so much built-in starch. Uh, and uh, we, we, we just... Uh, you, there, there's, it just seemed like, we're, and we're so skeptical, and, and we got to see it, and then we'll believe it. <laughs> and it's uh, there's there's so much pride in us. And as I lay there in bed that night, I thought, God, if I just knew how to put my finger on the things that stops the flow of your spirit, and He said, I'm going to tell you, in English, plain English, that you can understand. Every Bible I get. Between the Old and New Testament, I write down these things that the angel told me that night. He said, and I used to, I had a scripture for each one, but that would take too long. So you look up your own scripture. But I'm, go I'm going to read you the list of things. He's, I'll never forget how slowly and distinctly he said each one of these words. He said, you want to know what stops the flow of God's Spirit, he said, I'm going to tell you in your modern vernacular so you can understand and check and see. And I have observed it over and over again every single time that uh, I allowed some of these things to get into my life. I could feel the anointing and that flow of the Spirit of God. And I don't know if I have ever come to the place. Yes, yes, yes. I remember twice that Everything got out of the way, and God did what he wanted to do. But let me just read you this list. I am not going to preach about these things. I am simply going to give you this list. Uh, if uh, you should be interested, in, and I am not didn't really mean to use a sermon as an advertisement, but the book that this is all written in is called In the Bag, uh, in case you should be interested. But uh, and, and I don't have any with me, so I'm not selling books. Uh, there are 18 things that he gave me, and maybe this isn't in the order of importance, uh, but it is more or less in the order that he gave them to me because they were printed on my mind. So, you know, it was long after he left that I couldn't still move. I mean, I, it was impossible for me to move. Only daylight the next morning could I get up and I got some paper and pen and I wrote down. And number one was unbelief. Oh, God, forgive us. Lord, I believe. Help mine unbelief. <laughs> Verse 2, disobedience. Don't ever think God's Spirit can flow when you're disobedient. Fear. I am shocked and amazed at the fear that grips so many of God's people. Forget about folks in the world. I don't mean to forget about them, but not, don't even consider them. Just look at us. The fear. Fear of cancer. Fear of what's going to happen to our children, our family, those we love. Fear of what's going to come on the world. Rebellion is number four. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Jealousy. Uh, there's a lot more of that than we admit of. Bitterness. God deliver us from bitterness. Root of bitterness is a terrible thing. Lust. Lust is featured in our world today. Uh, magazines that were just had helpful hints for the home and when I went to Africa when I come back and saw them, they looked like pornographic literature and read like pornographic literature a lot of them I don't subscribe to any of them anymore I thought it'd be so nice to get back to the States because I remembered what it was before I went I was gone a long time and I'm careful what I read and what I have in my home lust number nine ten malice a lot of people don't understand malice if you're ever glad for somebody else's misfortune, that is malice. If you ever say things like this, oh, they had it coming. It's high time they find out how the rest of the world lives. 
malice. Number 11 is greed. You wouldn't think that children of God would have to hear about greed, but we are greedy. 12, number 12, there's some of these are double headers, and that one is anxiety, worry. This is what makes Americans look like such a sad sack bunch of people. There, you know, when you go to people like the Ethiopians that have lost everything, they don't have anything. They have found out that Jesus is the only thing that's important. That's all. Nothing else is important. And with us Americans, money still counts. Things, as has been said, possessions. This world's good. God, deliver us. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God. Number 13, and we have to all say guilty on this, and brother, our brothers touched on it this morning, judging and criticism. You cannot judge and criticize others and the spirit flow. It can't flow past it. Fourteen, grumbling and complaining. Fifteen, pride and ambition. They go hand in hand. And you know, that's amazing. I was with a young preacher, beautiful little church, little country church. I love to go visit those. And sweet spirit, and they had a steady flow of people being saved I said oh brother how blessed you are this is such a wonderful situation you're in here he said this will do for now and his ambition was to get a bigger church and a bigger town and we we still reach for honor with ambition and pride number 16 temp temper that isn't all gone yet. Number 17, selfishness and covetousness. He said those two together. Number 18, impatience. All right, God, get it done for me, please, by yesterday. We, you know, that patiently waiting, there is some patient waiting and walking with God. The preachers can preach to you about these things, but let me tell you what else the angel said. If God can find enough empty pipes, that's what we are, just a pot of clay. He wants to knock the bottom out and make us just empty pipes, empty channels, empty canals that he can pour his spirit through. And if we can ever come to the place that he can pour his spirit through. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. I watched a man of God in a service in Africa. That that man cannot even speak a one word of English except hello. That's all he can say. But I watched that man as he stood and other, the others were praying for people, but he just reached his hand and I could almost just see the healing flowing from that man's hand. And he reached his hand and that was all it took. And I saw, and the people praying thought maybe their prayers might have done it, but I saw, God opened my spiritual eyes and I could see that that man just, the shadow of Peter as he walked down the street healed the sick people. You see, if, if God were to do that with us, could he trust us with it? We'd have to write it up an account for the Pentecostal Herald. I walked down the street, and this lame man jumped up and started walking. Uh, and then we'd go further, and then we'd get so big that we couldn't just be confined to any one little group. We'd have to get out there where we can touch everybody. He can't trust us yet because there's not enough of his spirit flowing through us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And as the messenger left me, he said, if ever you forget this message, you will grieve God. He said, whenever these words come to you, flow. You hear the spirit whisper, flow, 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 flow. That means you are to talk about this. He said, and tell the people of God, get the flow. That's what you need is the flow of God's spirit. It's not just getting it one time. It's not enough. It's supposed to be a continual thing. It isn't ever supposed to, you're not supposed to settle down. I heard two old ladies talking about a new convert, and he was wild. I mean, he was just, he just running up and nabbing everybody and telling them about the Holy Ghost. And they one said to the other, said, he'll settle down after a while. We used to be like that. He never meant for us to settle down. 
He, he never meant for us to get over it. He meant for us to keep that flowing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's why he talked about the first love. <laughs> to that banquet. If it is not full, well, when I got back to her and told, agreed to go, she said, I still like three more. And I said, well, I will help you hunt. We finally found three more. So there was 25 of us. And we went to this banquet. But all night the night before, I said, God, I want to be a witness. Now, we think about witnessing as being a very fluent and having a lot of scriptures on the tip of our tongues and being able to say just the right word. Uh, but I knew I wouldn't even have, ch have a chance to say anything there. I'm going there to eat the banquet and to listen to a program that they have prepared for us but I prayed God I want to be a witness when I got there they seated me in the middle of the table and then up at this end of the table there was uh, three ladies and they were going to entertain us and the first one I uh, spoke about their choir uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and she said and uh, I thought about you know this is a little condemnation on us so that she said they come to practice on Sunday morning at a quarter after seven and she bragged. She said, we have uh, professional people. We have teachers, uh, school principals, doctors, nurses, specialists. And she went down the list. And she said, but if these people miss a practice, uh, then they have to have a doctor's certificate. They have to have a real reason. Excuses won't do. But to think of people that are that dedicated to a false doctrine, they condemn us in more ways than one. They send their sons and they can't get married until they first serve a term as what they call a missionary and the family supports them. You see them walking around but twos, you know, black pants, little black tie, white shirts. And they don't have a real gospel. It's based on a myth. And we have the real gospel and we sit down and sleep <laughs> and are so satisfied. But anyway, I enjoyed her talking about the choir and telling how, they, uh, how dedicated they were. She said they come to the church at a quarter after seven and they never get away before two or three in the afternoon because after the service they do recordings and they practice. Uh, and uh, so then uh, the next lady gets up to speak. Uh, and remember, Lord, I want to be a witness. <laughs> I want to be a witness. Well, she had her little spiel memorized and she started and she got so far and then she forgot and the other two looked at her in dismay and she went back back she said just let me start over and she started all over and she didn't get that far the second time and so then she started over the third time and finally she stopped and she pointed at me she said you in the pink jacket what have you done who are you what is it that's coming from you that won't let me talk <laughs> We don't have to outwit them. <laughs> we don't have to out talk them. Uh, we don't have to give a rebuttal. All we have to do is let the Spirit flow, and that's going to take care of everything. The Spirit of God flowing is going to take care of everything. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> I, I was so shocked. Her words shocked me so that I nearly slid under the table. I, I, and I, I never said a word. Never opened my mouth. Sister Beckton told her something. I don't even know what she told her. I don't want to know. Uh, but uh, God showed me the way he wants to win the battle for us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You remember that uh, silly bunch of men that went out to arrest Jesus? And when he said, I am, they all fell. I mean, they couldn't stay, you know, when it was now down. Isn't this a nice uh, arresting party, you know? Uh, I mean, they all fall flat. <laughs> and, I mean, he had to help them, you know, <laughs> so that they could go ahead and do their dirty work. Uh, because they, the, the power that was in him was so great. Here, we're coming to get you with, filled with hatred. And flop, here they all flopped out on the ground. Uh, God is so great. He doesn't need our little efforts. I've spent so much time of my life trying to help him, and none of it's ever worked. <laughs> uh, if I can only get myself out of the way, 
Get this pipe empty and cleansed and let his spirit flow and his spirit flow. And I feel impressed to tell you something else. Somebody come up to me the other day and said, did you all ever have any failures over there? I said, oh man, we had many of them. Uh, one of the biggest flops that we ever had was a tent meeting I was supposed to hold. The man came from a town called Fondabelle Park, which was 115 miles from where we live. He and his wife got the Holy Ghost. He was a mature man. He and his wife were in their 50s. And so they started begging, come and hold us a meeting. Come and, and put up a tent in our town. And we got to get a church in our town. And it can, you've started many churches with tent meetings, so come and start one in our... And we were just at that time, we were spread so thin and... It, there just wasn't any way. And finally he said, well, let Sister Freeman come. You, you don't have to come, Brother Freeman. Just let Sister Freeman come. Just come over there and get the tent up and we'll take care of everything. Well, finally, Brother Freeman figured out a way that we could, I could go for two weeks. So he and some of the young men went over, put up the tent, handed out flyers and made some little signs. And, and I'm to drive over Sunday afternoon. So the services will start that night. When I walked in their home, he said, um, did you bring me my certificate? I don't even know what he's talking about. It, I was so surprised. I said, certificate? He said, yeah, if, if anybody gets saved, I'll automatically be the pastor. And the man's never preached. I mean, he, uh, you know, but he, I said, brother, he said, your husband ought to understand that he should give me a certificate. I said, brother, you, you don't understand. Brother Freeman doesn't have the authority to give you a certificate. That is an action of the board based on a call from God and your experience and your qualifications. He said, all right then, if you didn't bring me a certificate, I'm not going to help you in your old tent meeting. That's when I found out it was mine. <laughs> I, I thought <laughs> I, I hadn't gone there with that impression. The man had a beautiful voice to sing, and so I thought, now he can, I never have, uh, after God got me straightened out on I've never minded preaching, but I'm hopeless as MC and, and doing anything else. But bless God, I had to do it all. <laughs> this man and his wife, both of them rather large, they just took two chairs and put them over at the side, folded their arms on their chest, and there they sat and with a sneer on their face. And I get up with my little accordion and lead the singing and pray. I got to do it all, you know. This and, the, and the people that would come, people did come, but they'd look at me and then look at them and trying to reconcile the two. And uh, it was uh, anything I tried to do. I, I have never gone through such a... Uh, a terrible time as that tent meeting. I, I, I'd wake up later on and just think about it and, and just feel tired just thinking about it because when you, you, it's all, there's nobody saying amen, there's nobody helping you. And by the time I got through testifying and praying and emceeing and, and playing the accordion, trying to lead the singing, I, I, I did some little courses on little sheets and, and then I'd give an altar call. Some of the little kids would come and they'd sit down on their knees and giggle at each other, you know, and just, it was all just a joke. And, then I'd go back to the refrigerator. I had no money. I had to stay with them. That was the original plans. And the second day that I was there, I heard the breakfast dishes, you know, and so I heard rattling. And so I got up and hurried. I thought, oh, my, uh, I'm running behind. And, well, I was nearly ready. So I was sitting in the chair reading my Bible. So I got up and finished dressing and slipped on my shoes and went, came out. And she said, your food is not ready yet. I'll call you when it's time to eat. Well, I went back and stayed till she called me, and she had me a little plate set by myself. And I always did hate to eat by myself. And she set me down there, and I, it was considerable difference in what was in there for me to eat and what was in the kitchen that I'd seen that they were eating. But that's all right. I didn't mind that either. But uh, the, it was uh, the, the whole time I'm there now, there is no fellowship. I phoned Brother Freeman near the end of the second week. I said, honey, I know that if we say two weeks, it's two weeks. I know that. But I said, this is a reproach to God and man. I, I think we'll bless, we'll bless the Lord by pulling this tent down and getting out of here because this is, this is not going to work. It's not working. I've never struggled so hard in my life if I just had a song leader. He said, well, I'm disappointed that the brother has disappointed you and me too. And he could have led the singing and been a great blessing. Uh, but uh, he said, uh, I still think you better go on another week. Bless him. Thank God. I'll forever thank God that he said that. Uh, he said, I'll send you some help. Uh, well, the only person he could find was a sweet little old lady who couldn't carry a tune, but at least she could say amen, and that helped. 
and, uh, and I, I had somebody to eat with. I didn't have to eat by myself. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I, I dreaded going to that tent. When I walked out of there, I felt like brushing off the dust of my feet <laughs> because it was, it was so pitiful uh, because it just seemed like the only thing in the second week on the Tuesday night, a backslidden preacher's wife uh, from an another city was driving through and, and saw a sign and followed the sign and she came in the tent and came to the altar and prayed through and got back in her car and went on her way. If she'd have stayed, it would have helped. You know, just had one. But that was the only thing that happened. Thank God for that. I'm not minimizing that. But Thursday night, there was a young black man stopped me as I stepped out of the tent. I've explained to you the segregation we had then. And he said, Madam, I was here outside last night. And I enjoyed your address so much. Uh, he said, I took the liberty of calling together some of my friends and family, and they're waiting. And we live in a little village about five miles from town. Would you come and speak to my family and friends? And I looked at my friend and said, what do you think? She said, would they still be there? He said, oh, they will wait all night if necessary. He said, we are hungry for God. And that was all it took for me. I said, yeah, yeah, we'll come. And I went over and said to my, uh, my host and hostess, they had already given me a key. I said, uh, we will be a little bit late. We're going out. This young man is a school teacher. And this is a Zulu community. And he's going to interpret for me. And we're going out to hold another service there. And the man told me I was crazy. But uh, I said, well, I feel led of the Lord to go. So I went. My pulpit was a table on the back, little back porch. The little back porch was about six feet wide. And... Uh, long, six feet long and four feet wide and had two candles to read the Bible by and the people brought their own little seats or sat on the grass uh, but there was over a hundred people there waiting and uh, I thought I was tired till I got up and began to minister to people that were hungry oh <laughs> I trust that the day will come when you the children of God will come to church hungry if you ever come to church hungry, you better pray for your preacher because you'll make him preach yourself to death. That, that's, that's what I do when I get where people are hungry. I, something in me responds to that hunger. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. And the young man was an excellent interpreter. And preaching with the interpreters, it never bothered me, uh, except when it got to be four of them. That was kind of difficult because I never always forgot where I was. <laughs> I forgot what I said last, but the time they got it translated. But uh, the one interpreter, and he was, they were very interested. And uh, I, I, after the service, he said, will you come back again tomorrow night? And I said, yes, I will come back. But uh, you'll have to guide me out here. I don't think I will remember the, all these twists and turns. He said, oh, I will be there. I'm going to bring, now that I see you will not mind, I'm going to bring a carload and we can listen outside and hear you at the tent too. Well, even uh, Friday night service is a little better because I know there's an audience out there, a little small one in the car, that are listening, that are hungry. Uh, and the ones that I was speaking to were not hungry. There was none of them that were really hungry. It was just curiosity that brought them out. Had a different crowd almost every Every night the only ones that came every night was a few little naughty kids and uh, they were there to bless me uh, and uh, so uh, but that Friday night oh listen the crowd had grown uh, there was a little road that the car lights would flash on the group and my friend counted them the second night and she said sister Freeman there was over 200 people sitting out there uh, well I could only see really uh, teeth and eyeballs <laughs> uh, because there was uh, we had no lights uh, and uh, but uh, there was again such a beautiful spirit and Sunday morning I said to her I never thought that I'd ever be sorry when this tent meeting ended but this might be my last night to preach to those precious people and uh, I, I we will we'll arrange to get somebody to come and carry on with what has begun we'll get one of our preachers from another area or not too far away to come but uh, I, I could not only you know if I'd have had my way I'd have just gone in the tent and got up there and said now I'm glad you all came and may God wish the blessing and I will stand and be dismissed because I just couldn't hardly wait to get out there but I knew if my husband was there he'd say uh, give it your best go ahead and do your best even when it's hard so I went ahead and I tried and it was just as dry as it had been every other night uh, and when I walked out I didn't 
shake off the dust of my feet. I said, all right, Lord, just promise me one thing that someday there will be a church built here for these people in this town. And God did answer that prayer later on. And there's a beautiful church there today. And God is blessing and has been blessing there for many years. But we got out again to that service. And as I began to preach that night, oh, there was such an anointing there. My friend later on told me that the crowd had swollen to over 300 people. And uh, I'm just preaching. And it seemed like the anointing was so heavy. And the funny thing about it is I can never, I've never been able to remember where I started or what I was talking about. Uh, but there came a point when my interpreter stopped and put his head in his hands and began to weep. And I said, oh, my. And I thought in my mind, I said to myself, he stopped and I can't. I mean, there was such an anointing on me. I thought only 10% of these people will understand, but I've got to keep going. And I'm preaching away, and I'm preaching away. And I don't know how long I'll preach before it finally dawned on me. I'm not preaching English. I'm preaching Zulu. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't think... I did not think that I would ever tell anybody this part of the story. But as I was preaching, all of a sudden, I felt the Spirit of God lift me. And I preached for 30 minutes floating in the air. I don't know why God did it that way, but maybe it was just an encouragement for me to let me know that his hand is on me. I thought, I'll never tell anybody about that. They'll think I'm crazy. Uh, but uh, I, I got, I've got old enough now. I don't care what you think. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. That, <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah. I better rephrase that. I do care what you think. Uh, what I mean to say is that nothing that you think will stop what I feel like I should do. That's the way I should have said it. I didn't say it right. There was a second time that God had done that for me. Uh, the other time was also a time of great crisis and a great need. And it was my own daughter that come and said, Mother, you never did float around while you was preaching before. That was awesome. <laughs> so I said, well, honey, I never faced a, I had a church about to split. My husband's in America. America, and a preacher's fallen into adultery and I had a heart attack the night before uh, because of, from all the trouble and nearly got sent to jail uh, I mean I stood there in front of the judge and he said uh, 15 pounds or 30 days and, and I felt in my pocket I had about 45 cents 15 pounds was like uh, I can't think of I never can figure on my feet but it was much four times that money <laughs> and uh, I felt the 45 cents I had in my pocket the equivalent of it uh, and he, I thought, saw myself going to jail with something that I did not know uh, this insurance had expired. My, my husband had tried to tell me about it, but the phone rang, and I went on to answer the phone, and he's t shaving and talking uh, while he's leaving, and I didn't hear him. And so that's how I got into trouble there. And I just faced so many things. And then the whole congregation is about to split, and I said, all of you come one more time for one more service. And they came in at that service. God confirmed his spirit, his power and his anointing and the church did not split and God sent another pastor uh, later on and was able to build up what had been broken down but you see God is so great but that, what I want to tell you is this that night uh, when this when I'm preaching Zulu now I, I had learned a few key words like heaven and hell and devil and angels and, and, and repent and be baptized in Jesus name and Holy Ghost I knew those words and I'd hear some of them coming by once in a while but I do not have any idea what I preached to those people but I saw a man get up and come to my interpreter and try to give him money uh, and he, he wouldn't take the money and they put their arms around each other and they knelt praying together and God filled both of them with the Holy Ghost and then I saw people all over that congregation I've never preached as good a sermon since as I, that night because all over that congregation people went to each other and wept in each other's arms and the Holy Ghost was poured like rain I purposely did not even try to count and see how many I just felt like I've still got to drive 115 miles home uh, and uh, I, I, I felt when the spirit lifted and I settled back down on the porch but this time the young man is up just rejoicing in the Lord and I went to him I said brother I've got to go if I don't leave now my husband will be worried about me but I will send one of our preachers to come and baptize you in the name of Jesus and a work was started for God that night in that wonderful way let me tell you no matter what you face God knows how to handle a situation and if we can just come to the place that we will open up our lives to him and clean out our hearts of all these 
instead of silly things that we're holding on to, then the Spirit of God can flow through us and we will reach our world. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I close, I want to close with a vision God gave me in Africa. And he said, this is America and this is what is going to happen. Brother Cole, what happened in Ethiopia is going to happen in America. I don't know what it's going to take to get us in the shape, but I saw churches with people surrounded, just a sea of people outside trying to get inside our churches. You see, there's a lot of people just trying to get attendance, but I saw people doing everything they could to get inside the church. And I saw the Holy Ghost poured out, pouring just down like rain on hungry hearts. And I know that God has closed the chapter on our missionary work and sent us back so that we can speak to you to build your faith and help you to understand. Uh, stop being negative and stop wondering why God don't do it. Just open up and get the flow of the Spirit of God. That's what we need today more than anything. Anything else in it? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Get the flow. Get the flow. Clean out the house and get the flow in Jesus' flow of your spirit. Help me to get out in the river. I'm going to trade my bucket in for a river, Lord. Praise God. Oh, thank the Lord. Do you think we're hearing from heaven? Dear God, move in our district. Move in our churches. Move in your churches, Lord. Move among us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> oh. God. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We wait on you, Lord. Ah, give us a new vision and a new burden for revival, the move of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Praise God. river in this land. Let it flow. It is the river of my spirit. It is my power that has brought this river into being. I paid the price upon the cross for this river to flow. If you will trust me, if you will lean upon me, and not upon your methods, but upon what I will do through you, then this river will flow through your midst. It will flow into your city. It will flow through your church. It will flow through your life. Everywhere you go, everything you do, my power will flow through you. Do not trust in methods, but trust in what my power can do through your life. I want to move in your midst. There is a river in this land. Let it flow. Ah, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I will tell you this. You have a right to rejoice in the things that you have heard. You have a right to praise me in the things that you have heard. These are great and mighty things. But the things you have not seen and have 
Praise God. Oh. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's love him together. I feel like we're in a time of visitation. Help me, Lord, to discern. Lord God. Praise God. The time of your visitation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, let a fresh vision be birthed in us. Praise God. Let new faith, tenacious faith, be birthed in us, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. What a time, Lord. I have been places where we heard the word of God and then we just cut it off and walked out the door and didn't give the spirit of the Lord time, just a little time to implement, to fashion, to deepen, to implant. Praise God. That's why we're waiting just for a little bit here. Praise the Lord. You don't overhaul, overhaul a car in five minutes. <laughs> oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Do you know he's here? He's talking to us. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Oh, God. Help us to flow with you to flow with you to flow with your power and love we pray in Jesus name thank you God There's something in our churches Lord Through our ministries Lord praise God hallelujah Praise God. Oh. Ah. You're great, Lord. You're great, Lord. Praise the Lord. Prayer of submission. Oh, glory to God. Praise the Lord. A prayer that we all need to pray today. Say, Lord, I submit myself to your word. I submit myself, Lord, to the Holy Ghost. Submit myself, Lord Jesus, to the dealings of God. Praises to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Praise God. We submit ourselves, Lord, to you. In the fear of God. 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 Praise the Lord. There might be some of you that would like just to skip lunch. You feel free to do that and hang around the altar. Praise God. You feel free to do that. Brother, Brother Tony Tamil has a few comments for us.